Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's Angela Lovzarenka, Program Director at Lactation Education Resources, with my colleague today, today Sakita Lewis-Johnson. Good afternoon, morning, and evening. Thank you all for joining. I am the accredited Provider Program Director for Lactation Education Resources, and I am excited to talk about the realities of becoming and being an IBCLC. So thank you all for joining us today. I am a board certified lactation consultant. I have been board certified for 25 years. Before that, I worked in the community and peer support. I've worked in uh, hospital settings. I've worked also in uh, outpatient lactation uh, support and private practice, as well as served on a few boards of directors for the profession. How about you, Sakita? Yes, I've been in, um, it's coming up on 15 years, so 14 years to be exact. I've been an IBCLC prior to that. I was a CLC five years prior to that, so I've been doing this work for a minute. I've also bring you experience from working as an IBCLC in the hospital setting, as well as doing home visits and private practice. Excellent. So let's go ahead and get started here. Yes. First of all, just want to provide you with a little bit of the landscape. If you would like to ask questions, feel free to do so. You can see the question box. So it's super easy. Take a look, see the blue arrow there. If you're participating on a laptop today or a desktop computer, you'll notice here with the blue arrow where you can find that question box. And then if you are participating today on a mobile device, take a look at the green arrow and down near the bottom of the interface for GoToWebinar, you will see the question button and you can type in comments to us. You can say hello if you'd like, you can ask questions. And I'm really curious where uh, is everyone participating today? Where in the world are you located? So if you'd like to type that into the question box just to test it out, we'd love to see where you are where are, you are living and being today. So joining our webinar, we also have Wendy Lawrence. She is a member of our customer support team and very experienced. They will be, or she will be monitoring the questions in the chat and she will leave a few of them. She'll answer them as best as she can, but she will leave a few of them for us so that we can answer during the recording. Also, we have Jill, a member of our tech team, who's also on the call to help with any tech issues you may be having. If you're watching, to this, rec watching this recording on YouTube, you can post your questions in the comments below. You can also contact our amazing customer support staff at support at lactationtraining.com. Okay, let's dive in and take a closer look at what a lactation consultant is and how you can follow your passion to become one. If you decide to become an IBCLC, you will join more than 34,000 IBCLCs in over 129 countries and territories. Credentialing as a lactation consultant is offered by the International Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners. Take a look at their website, iblce.org. They have different regional offices depending on where in the world you reside or work. Review the requirements and pathways to become eligible to take the IBLCE certification exam. What do you need to know? The detailed content outline, also known as the exam blueprint, is based on surveys of IBCLCs in various practice settings around the globe. The outline covers all of the topic areas and chronological stages an IBCLC needs to know in their work. LER's courses cover the entire detailed content outline, and our courses are approved by LARC. That's the Lactation Education Accreditation and Approval Review Committee. That's the organization that evaluates and approves lactation consultants training courses. Now, Sakita is going to chime in and she is going to review a few questions to ask yourself today. Sakita? Thanks, Angela. So, before we get into the nitty gritty, so there, if you've been trying to become an IBCLC, or even if you have not looked into all of the things it takes as far as requirements to sit for the exam, you're in the right spot. I will uh, let you know that 
you, we are going to definitely uh, talk about the realities. And oftentimes uh, folks are like, I want to become an IBCLC, but sometimes they don't know all of the things that IBCLCs do. So that's why we're here in this space. So before we dive deep, just ask yourselves a couple questions. And I would, uh, I would recommend writing these questions down just to reflect on them later on during the day after you get all the information. So the questions to ask yourself is, do I have these skills? Um, and if you don't have those skills, that's what we're going to talk about. How do you get those skills? But where will I get these skills? Uh, and we, you'll see why I have these two questions as our jump off points. When I talk about skills, I am talking about all sorts of skills. I'm not just talking about the skills that requires touch um, and doing. Uh, I'm talking about skills and rules of engagement. And so uh, let's go on this journey. And I hope that you will leave here with the understanding of the realities of becoming and being an IBCLC. So, Let's let's just get to it. So, what makes an IBCLC? We're going to spend a, a little bit of portion on the the key components, and this is not an all inclusive list. I these are just the uh, ones that pop out. We could keep adding to it if you really want to be honest about the realities, but I'll keep it I'll keep it uh, kind of small so that you understand the key components. So competency is critical. Um, you, we really have to be to know what we're doing, uh, when we're doing, and how we're doing. So competency means that you have the ability, the knowledge, and the skills to do a task successfully. So in a nutshell, uh, we're talking about being able to do things according to what the IBLCE says are within our scope of practice. Are we competent? And so when we think about that, sometimes we think about there's this spectrum from novice to expert. To expert. So novice means, yes, I have foundational um, knowledge and I have some skills, but no, I haven't done everything. I haven't had this clinical experience or that clinical experience, but you are working towards it. So to be considered an expert, it means that you've had some time in the field, you've kind of seen some things, been around some time enough to be proficient and competent in, um, in your knowledge. So that's what I really want to just impress upon you is that competency is to ensure that you're doing no harm. Again, that you have the ability, the knowledge, and the skills. So at the end of your training, you do want to be confident that you are doing no harm. And that's essentially why competency is important. Culturally appropriate and credible. You know, when I think about culturally appropriate, um, I think that this takes on it's so many words that we when we talk about how ways of being in the cultural framework. But if you've worked in healthcare or been around anyone in healthcare um, or even in business sectors, you may have heard the word culturally competent. And so as I just spoke about the word competent, you know, one of the things that pops in my head is, is, or one of the questions I should say that pop in my head is, is can I ever be competent in someone else's culture? Meaning that that sense of the mastery. To me, I, I, I think not, but you know, uh, I think that some scholars will probably say, oh, well, you can, I don't know. But we really need to be clear. That's what I'm talking about is clear in our language. And it's so important uh, these days to make sure that we're saying things that really make sense. So culturally appropriate is more fitting for where we do. We want to be, we want to uh, start our journey with understanding what it means to be culturally appropriate by really starting with cultural humility. And cultural humility is this lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique where we learn 
about our own culture first, um, and then we examine our own uh, our own beliefs and cultural identities, and that therefore we can uh, really have this reflective and self check uh, before engaging with other cultures that may be different from ours. Um, and when we know that um, there are so many different cultures and subcultures that we want to try not to treat folks as just simply um, a monolithic part of the culture. So their culture, their identified culture. So uh, let's see, we want to avoid saying things like, hmm, it's not in their culture to do that, right? So that's one of the things about developing culture of humility is that you're not feeding into stereotypes. You're not making assumptions based on what someone will or won't do based on their culture, because we really don't know unless we've been told by a particular person that this is a part of my culture. This is what I believe in. Um, credibility. Credibility goes hand in hand with being culturally appropriate. Um, and I think about cult credibility as how credible are you when you're asked something that you don't have the answer to? How do you respond? So some people, particularly when it comes to breast and chest feeding, some people try to uh, go off their own lived experience or try to answer off a whim, sometimes not knowing the answer. Um, so I ask that question um, because almost everyone wants to share their breast or chest feeding story, right? Um, their story of, oh, it didn't hurt me, or it really hurt bad, or, um, you know, those sorts of things. So you want to be credible. You really want to look for the evidence and look for the information. If you don't have the answer, you want to make sure that you then go find the answer. So we're not like walking dictionaries or computers. It's not possible to know everything, but demonstrating credibility is about being forthcoming and being able to say, I'm not quite sure about that, let me get back to you and then check your resources and then circle back to the client in a, in a timely manner. Um, keeping in mind that credibility is everything. It's everything for you, but it's also everything for the profession. If you lose credibility as a lactation consultant or lactation supporter, it could translate to other IBCLCs losing credibility unfairly. Policy advisor, creator, Whew, or creator, that's what that should say. So a couple of other things that we do as IBCLCs, we advise on policy. We actually help create policies. And that's important to know from a standpoint of talking about clinical care. So remember I asked, do you have the necessary skills? Well, if you've already had work in policy, and you know policy and that's your strong suit, I would be like, yeah, you have some skills. Um, so we need you because as I said before, language is important. The language and policies matter because a poorly written policy can end up with unintended negative consequences. So if you are a policy person and that's your thing, you have that piece of it, um, but also, being a stakeholder is another form of policy work. We're stakeholders so that we are able to sit at the table whenever there are lactation specific or related policies that are being discussed. So maybe policy is not your strong suit, but as an IBCLC, you want to know how policies are created and how they impact us because that then informs your advocacy. And advocacy is probably the biggest, biggest part of what we do. And I said probably because, you know, but I think it is. An advocate is simply a person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy. So even if you're not a policy advisor, so to speak, you can be that person listening to how policies are creating and sharing your own personal perspective or lived experience. 
We are problem solvers. This is a, probably about 90% of what we do because each family has their own concerns. And really when lactation consultants are called for support, it usually is a request secondary to some sort of problem or issue that a family may be experiencing. So be mindful about framing lactation concerns from a one size fits all framework and know that not one, one size never fits all. And we really should come into a situation problem solving from the lens of um, individualizing that particular family and the concerns they're sharing. Along with the problem solver, remember I said you have to go back and sometimes say, I don't know. And that's called being a researcher. So there are two ways you can be a researcher. You can be a researcher that carries out academic or scientific research, or you can be that person whose job involves discovering or verifying information, and that would make all of us. So remember I said we're not walking dictionaries, we don't have everything in our head, but we do and we should be aware of valid and reliable tools that inform our practice. I'll tell you one of the tools that informs my practice is the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine protocols. So that's what I mean by tools. High level lactation care and skilled lactation care, they both go hand in hand. When we talk about high level lactation care, we're talking about uh, the care that usually fits outside the realm of um, uncompl of uncomplicated cases. So when we think about the complexities, we, we think about the basic breastfeeding, which is knowledge of skin to skin, knowledge of positioning and latch. Um, when I say high level, sometimes those levels, there's a, a framework that's called lactation acuity, um, and it really talks about the point of care, what a client needs based on what's going on with a parent and what's going on with a child. Um, so when we think about this, we have to think about the spectrum of people that are lactating. So someone who is in the ICU that's intubated or on life support who was lactating prior to becoming on life support, but they need to continue and they want to continue to be able to deliver their milk that is a very high level case. Now, don't get scared and be like, whoa, what, what? No, I gave you probably one of the worst scenarios, but that's just let you know that that's not out of the realm. So when you're taking care of someone, um, say for instance, who intubated on life support, had a brain injury, do you really think about how does the brain injury impact lactation? Are you able to connect? Are you able to make those connections? So when you're doing the training, sometimes it's it's a ton, it's a ton of work to train to become an IBCOC. And you're like, why do I need to know about the brain or all these cranial nerves? Just know that in order to deliver deliver and to be able to critically think like an IBCLC, you need to know the brain because that is the care that we deliver that really sets IBCLCs apart. And it's being able to handle complex clinical cases with sound clinical decision-making and recommendations that are appropriate for higher level acuities of care. So when we talk about acuity, we talk about the level of care necessary for the best outcomes. So, uh, yeah. That's, 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 that's one of the things that sets us apart. And then when we think about essential and timely, one of the things we found out during the pandemic, we found a new buzzword called essential. And we found out that yes, lactation consultants are essential because babies still need to eat. People are still having children. And even during a pandemic, promoting and protecting the ability to provide human milk is critically important. Not just for bonding and, and for the family, but also from a public health and prevention standpoint. So we are essential and it's important that we show up when we are needed and that we are timely. And sometimes that means that um, I think 
here lately, it means that our ability to say, no, 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 I can't help, um, kind of is a rude awakening because we're not in that position. We're in this pandemic. And so if we say no, that means that we're not frontline workers, which I would say that we are. Um, so I just want to make it real clear that when we talk about, you know, um, all these modes of health, of help, I'm sorry, of telehealth, of in-person, of telephone support, sometimes understanding that in a pandemic, people still do rely on that hands-on, need that hands-on. So we are essential, we are timely, and we really have to be really, um, let's see, conscious that telehealth sometimes can prohibit our ability to use other senses to make sound clinical recommendations. So you want to make sure that, um, you know, if you use telehealth, for instance, or if you're going in person, that you're doing it safely. But understand that time is of the essence whenever we're talking about a family needing assistance. If we don't make it in time, they don't meet their needs. Oftentimes it results in premature weaning. Collaborative care partner and trusted. Um, I love collaborative care partner. I, I think that that uh, determines kind of how I operate um, because what it does is it assumes that we're in collaboration with our families. It decenters ourselves in that we are not the decision makers. We are there to collaborate and help the family achieve their personal goals. So remember, um, that it's their fears and their barriers that takes precedence over our particular goals for them. So I'm saying all that to say that yes, we know the recommendations, exclusive breastfeeding for at least six months, we know all of those things and I promote all of those things and we do promote all of those things and it's still important to still honor and talk about them. However, we have to understand that we are collaborating in partnership, in agreement, and that when someone seeks our care, that we make sure that we approach it in a manner where we're not overstepping our boundaries, where we're not um, centering ourselves. And that's how you become trusted. In all honesty, you know, you're trusted then to do no harm to be reliable, trusted to say, I see you as a person. I see you and we're in this together. I'm not higher than you. We're collaborating to do what's best for you. And that's how you become trusted. When you go into any clinical situation and you assume an hierarchy like, yep, I'm the expert. Oh, I've seen this. I know what to do. Okay, just do this, do this. I'm gonna teach you this. I've been working for 15, 20 years. Folks will shut down. So when you go in and you touch someone without asking permission, they said they wanted assistance, right? It's incumbent on you to let them tell you the type of assistance they're looking for before you just go in and assume that the assistance means you have to touch. And that's how you become trusted. So I'm gonna skip to this person-centered um, approach. And earlier I said decentering ourselves, and this is where we are and where we should be striving to be as it relates, as it relates to any um, clinical situation with our families. So the Institute of Medicine defines patient-centered care as providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patients' values guide all clinical decisions. So I've talked a little bit about culture. I've talked about collaboration. I've talked about care, the type of care you deliver, and how communication works. And the person is the center of all. So if you want more information, you can visit the Institute of Medicine and you can read a little bit more about person-centered care. But I do want to give you a bit of caution. Person-centered care has become a buzzword, just like essential. Don't let it become a buzzword for you. Really practice 
what this model looks like. And then that would further build trust with you, not just with your client, but within your community and also within other clinicians that work around you. So we're going to move on to some anticipatory guidance. I started with two questions. I'm going to end with a few more questions. So Angela's going to begin talking about the pathways. So when she starts to talk, sometimes there's this need to fire off all these questions, but really listen for the following things. You want to think about what pathway do you fall under? which is your pathway to your journey to become an IBCLC. You want to think about your local market. What's going on around you market-wise? Are there lots of IBCLCs? I would probably say there's not, but um, is the market saturated or where is the most need at? Um, how does training to become an IBCLC, how does that fit in with your life? Other things to think about is, is do you, will you be wanting to do private practice? Or what does mentorship look like in your local community? And so I just want to, you know, um, leave you with those questions. I hope you write those questions down. I hope you reflect on those questions. And as Angela get into the pathway and the meat of why you are here, that um, you will be able to answer these for yourselves at the conclusion. So Angela, take it away. Thanks, Akita. Appreciate it. Okay, so now we're going to actually talk about the details and the steps to become an IBCLC. It can seem a bit complicated, but I'm going to break it down and give it to you like a roadmap to the IBCLC. The first thing you need to do is choose a pathway. Now we're going to come back to this in just a minute. Each pathway has three components. The first one is education. The second one is clinical hours. And the third one is exam prep. Okay, so the first component is health sciences education. So that is the typical education for healthcare providers. There are eight post-secondary or university level courses and six general education subjects. You can find a full list for each of the 14 subjects on the IBLCE website, or you can search for it uh, online, or you can find a link in the resource document. So just a quick note, in the GoToWebinar interface, you'll see a little area that says handouts. If you click on the handout, you'll get the PDF, which will reference a whole bunch of really helpful websites that you may want to use as you're trying to navigate your way towards the IBCLC. Now, the eight university level courses are, and you don't need to write these down right now, biology, anatomy, physiology, infant growth and child growth and development, introduction to clinical research, nutrition, psychology or counseling skills or communication skills, and finally, sociology or cultural sensitivity or cultural anthropology. They can be online or in person as long as the institution is accredited to provide the learning. If you took any of these courses during your college career, they count, even if it was 20 years ago. So LER partners with Union Institute and University and Walden University to provide the basic courses. Both organizations are online. The advantage of working with Union is their program director is an IBCLC, and they've chosen the college courses which meets the IBLCE requirements. If you want to get your bachelor's degree in maternal child health with a concentration in human lactation, take a look at Union. Another adv advantage is that both universities will accept financial aid, federal financial aid. Now, the six general ed topics are medical documentation, medical terminology, occupational safety and security for health professionals, professional ethics for health professionals, universal safety precautions and infection control, and basic life support. Five of the six general ed courses can be taken through LER. The only one you'll need to search for is basic life support. In many countries, there's an in-person skills check for this training. Now, I've heard of some organizations providing this training completely online. Check with your local resources. In the resources, there is a link to the health guidance, the health education guide. Now, the guide will provide you with general descriptions for typical courses in that subject area. 
Please keep in mind that the IBLCE is international. The names used in the document to describe the courses may not exactly fit the description of the course at your accredited educational institution. That's okay. The IBLCE uses broad terms with the understanding that there is no universal description for what a course, let's say, in clinical research will cover. So why are these 14 courses required? The IBLCE, excuse me, the IBCLC is a standalone credential, meaning you do not need another cert certification, degree, or license to practice as an IBCLC. Once you pass the exam, you will be an allied health professional. The courses will help you to be prepared for your degree, as well as to help you to pass the IBLCE exam. Okay, now, the second thing you need is the lactation-specific education, and that's where we have you covered. The education should be comprehensive and cover the IBLCE detailed content outline. IBLCE requires at least 90 hours of lactation-specific education and five hours on communication skills. Our five-hour course is specific to lactation and breastfeeding care to help you in your practice as a lactation consultant. The third component is lactation-specific clinical experience. This can be in-person consultations, telephone consultations, or online breastfeeding and lactation care that supports breastfeeding families. Also includes lactation assistance to pregnant and breastfeeding clients and lactation education to families and or professionals. Now, these hours need to be obtained in the five years immediately prior to applying for the exam. Well, how many do you need? That depends on your pathway. So the clinical hours also need to be accrued in the five years prior to applying for the exam. Now, here's a quick overview, and I'll review more in the following slides. So pathway one is for health professionals and those who provide breastfeeding support through an IBLCE recognized breastfeeding support counselor organization. Healthcare professionals include physicians, nurses, midwives, dietitians, physical therapists or physiotherapists, speech, patholo speech pathologists, and others. Breastfeeding support counselors include those accredited through organizations such as Lactation Education Resources, La Leche League International, and the Australian Breastfeeding Association. As of this presentation, there are over 40 organizations that have applied to IBLCE and have been approved. So Pathway 2 applicants must complete a comprehensive academic program in human, and breast, human lactation and breastfeeding through an accredited university program. Their education has both didactic and clinical components, and they require 300 clinical supervised hours working with breastfeeding families. Pathway three is a structured mentorship program between an IBCLC and the applicant. Now the IBLCE, IBCLC or the IBCLCs need to be in good standing with IBLCE. Those who choose this pathway must have their agreement and their program pre-approved by IBLCE prior to beginning their clinical hours. Now I understand that these days it's happening relatively quickly, like within a few weeks. Now a quick note, for those of you who have breastfed, chest fed, or provided human milk for your child, the hours you spent nursing, pumping, and helping your friends don't count towards your clinical hours. Now while 500 or 1,000 hours seems like a lot, there's a really good reason why. Each candidate needs to have the clinical experience necessary to provide the competent care that Sakita was referring to as an IBCLC. If it's any consolation, the number of hours used to be a lot more. I've known IBCLCs who needed anywhere from 2,500 to 8,000 clinical hours to sit the exam. So candidates who apply for the IBLCE exam through pathway one need 1,000 hours. So for that candidate who's also a healthcare provider, the hours can be done in a hospital, birth center, clinic, lactation care clinic, practice, or through independent practice as a licensed or registered healthcare professional in a non-healthcare setting. For breastfeeding support counselors from an IBLCE recognized organization, their hours can be earned in person or online. The location and type of support depends on the criteria provided by the recognized organization. The hours need to be counted on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. 
Now, two important points about the clinical hours. The first one is, is it's important to document those hours as you accrue them. Be very detailed in case IBLCE chooses to audit your application to take the exam. You may, they may want to see some sort of documentation, such as a spreadsheet or another document where you counted your hours. And the thousand hours for pathway one do not need to be directly supervised. Now, pathway three requires 500 hours of clinical experience. It's best done in a busy practice setting where you can work with many breastfeeding, chest feeding people, and those providing human milk for their babies every day, such as a hospital or clinic setting. The hours count towards your 500 only when you're actually working with families. Those observation hours that you're going to need do not count. Now remember that clinical experience is graduated. That is, it starts with observation, then doing tasks under supervision, and then completing those tasks independently with the IBCLC close by to ask questions and discuss those situations. LER has an internship program with many sites around the United States. Reach out to support at lactationtraining.com and we can connect you with our clinical internship director, Amy Black, to determine if we have a site in your area. If not, we can give you suggestions on how you can work with your local hospital to facilitate an internship site. Now, one thing that Amy wanted me to mention today is that you can't begin to count your hours towards those, that internship requirement until both you and the IBCLC are comfortable with you working independently. Most interns will spend about 75 hours in orientation before you can begin to accrue that 500 hours. Now, take a look in your community to see if you can find a willing internship site or mentors. You may need to reach out to many people to find someone with the time, experience, and capacity to agree to be your mentor. It's really important to find a good fit. Talk with others who've been through Pathway 3 to find successful strategies in finding that good mentor. Now, while this pathway takes an extra step or two, some people will ask, well, really, is it worth it? It is. Why? Because the IBLCE reports that students who come through Pathway 3 score best on the exam. I believe it's that mentorship piece that's really the key component. Learning from an experienced clinician is well worth the extra effort involved with finding one in the first place. Now, a lot of people are asking whether or not they can accrue clinical hours via telehealth during the pandemic. Now, the quick answer is yes. The longer answer is paraphrased from IBLCE documents, specifically those dated 17 April and 6 October of 2020. IBLCE will allow the use of technology if certain parameters are met. You'll need to pay attention to privacy rules and the code of professional conduct and the clinical competencies for IBCLCs. Another important point is there should be, quote, observation using technology in a two-way synchronous audio and visual components. The focus is on the mentor providing the mentoring and the guidance to the applicant. Now, this guidance has been extended until 30 September of 2023. It's important to read all of the IBLCE documents listed in the interim guidance. The link to the guidance is found in the resource document in the handout section of this webinar or in the comments which accompany this video. At LER, there are two ways to gather your lactation-specific education. One is the Lactation Consultant Training Program, or LCTP, which is the full 95 hours front to back. The other is either our core or bridge course. They're designed to meet your educational needs depending on your background and previous lactation training. So first we have a comprehensive course, Lactation Consultant Training Program. It's a 90 plus hour course, which is eligible for SERPs, CME, and nursing contact hours. It's intended for those who do not have any lactation education and they know they want to become an IBCLC. We have more, more than 35 of the most knowledgeable, experienced instructors who are practicing lactation consultants, researchers, and authors who teach in our courses, including Sakita and me. Our classes are economical. You can view them on a variety of devices, such as your computer, tablet, or phone. They're optimized for a computer, but they can be reviewed later when you're on the go. We've been educating people in person and online since 1990. 
We update our course information with the latest peer-reviewed evidence on a regular schedule, but we'll update sooner as new evidence emerges. And do you have questions for the instructor or want to discuss a concept with your fellow students? There are several ways to connect and get the answers you need. We have a very active Facebook group for those who are in our 95-hour course or core or bridge or exam review, where students can meet and support each other along the way. There are people who are IBCLCs in the group and they too can support your journey. Upon completion of the 95-hour course, you're eligible to take the Certified Breastfeeding Specialist exam. The exam is included in the price. Once you pass, you are a Certified Breastfeeding Specialist. This is to recognize you for the level of education you have attained. With this certification, you can begin to collect your clinical hours towards the IBLCE exam. Now, if you're not sure where to start or you have some lactation-specific education hours, then we have our core or bridge programs to meet your needs. They have the same advantages as the lactation consultant training program. Our initial course is called CORE because it will provide you with the core lactation education you need to understand what it means to begin supporting the normal course of breastfeeding. It's 52 hours long and it's all online. It covers the basics such as anatomy and physiology, infant growth and development, supporting the preterm baby, medications and breastfeeding, and so many more courses. At the end is a certified breastfeeding specialist exam. Now our bridge course is ideal for people who have basic lactation education components and need that additional 45 hours to qualify for the IBLCE exam. Topics in our bridge course include legal and ethical concerns for the lactation consultant, infant feeding in disasters, breastfeeding the infant with medical challenges, case studies, and clinical skills videos. So if you're not sure where to start, I would suggest the core course. Get your feet wet and see if becoming an IBCLC fits. Our 90-hour course, as well as our core and bridge courses, are available in Spanish. Capacitación en Lactancia is our new website, which provides the same high-quality education found on LER in Spanish. At LER, we believe that access to high-quality lactation education should not be limited to those who live in countries with high incomes. We recognize that living in certain parts of the world, the relative purchasing power of a local currency may make the cost of lactation education inaccessible. As part of LER's commitment to increasing access to lactation training worldwide, our pricing is adjusted according to the student's country of residence. In alignment with our continued commitment to diversity, Lactation Education Resources is proud to announce our Rising Tide Lactation Equity Scholarship programs designed to increase the number of Black and Latinx and Hispanic IBCLCs in the United States. We recognize one of the greatest obstacles to entry to the field is access, specifically demonstrated by financial barriers. LER will remove that barrier for Rising Tide Scholarship awardees. Now we alternate these scholarships each year. You can find out more information on our website, lactationtraining.com forward slash rising tide. Our team is here to help you now and in the future. We have tech support open seven days a week. You can get your questions answered by content experts in the field. And we have ongoing lactation support for the next steps in your career. Whatever you need, we're here to support your journey. Okay, thank you so much for your time today. And I say okay, because now I'm looking forward to one of my favorite parts, which are the questions. Y'all ask the best questions. So what questions do we have today? So Angela, I'm gonna kick us off. Uh, I, I first, I wanna say kudos to Wendy. She's been answering the majority of the questions. And so, uh, but we do have one that she flagged for us. So when documenting hours with La Leche La League, yes. <laughs> what specific information do I need to include in case of an audit? That's great. So what's really interesting is that um, if you are, if you have been working as a La Leche League leader, while I said that they're counted on an hour by hour basis, that was as of January 1st of 22. 
And so if you accrued hours prior to January 1st of 2022, and I believe it's 2022 and not 2021, and I know Wendy will ping me if I'm wrong, um, you could count them and it was, it was, you could count 250 hours per year. I'm 85% sure I'm sure I'm certain of that. So let's say that you were a La Leche League leader in 2018. So in 2018, 2019, 2020 and 21, you could count 250 hours. Therefore, you would have your thousand hours by then. And so, but if you became a La Leche League leader and are requiring or needing your hours, your um, lactation specific clinical hours to include 2022, you'll need to count those on an hour by hour basis. And so that would be running a support group that would be answering um, support, you know, the support forum online. That would also be any phone calls that you happen to receive, anything where you made those contacts and reported them to La Leche League, either La Leche League of your of your region or La Leche League International, whatever is appropriate for your for your area. So there we go. Someone else is asking if you're a, a nurse and but you do not work with um, lactating people, can Pathway 3 be done with a mentor? Absolutely. Uh, do feel free to reach out to some IBCLCs in your community to see where you can gather your 500 hours. So that's a great that's a great question. And one note about the IBCLC and, and the mentorship program is that you don't necessarily need only one mentor. There are some folks who will use several mentors. And especially if, let's say, one mentor only works in a hospital and another one only works in the community, another one maybe only works in a milk bank. And so between those IBCLCs, you can accrue your 500 hours. Do note, though, that each one of them will probably want, especially if they're not affiliated with each other, they're probably going to want to make sure that you are comfortable and confident working with families before you actually can start to accrue your hours. So remember, those observation hours are key to count prior to counting your observation, your actual work hours. Yeah, thanks, Angela. There's a question. Will I be able to do Pathway 3, 500 hours spread between two places? With Pathway 3, you have to submit an application and have to have approval from IBLCE to be able to do that. And so that is something that you would submit in an application and see, um, you know, if that is approved. Great. Okay, there's another question here. When you say observation hours do not have to be observed in person, what other way can they be observed? If you have an IBCLC mentor, do they, can they be in a different state? Absolutely, they can be in a different state or even a different country. So as long as, and so with the observation piece online, it would involve you observing the IBCLC and then having that two-way you know, synchronous um, audio and visual connection, then they would then watch you be able to you know, offer support. So let's say, for example, a good example of this could be uh, you know, setting up a breast pump. So let's say the parent that you're supporting uh, has a pump. And so you want to be able to, the, the lactation, the IBCLC may say, hey, why don't you, Sakita, why don't you go ahead and show us how you set up that pump? Now, of course, they're going to make sure that you're comfortable doing it. They're not just going to pitch it to you cold. But if you, if they know that you're comfortable in setting up a pump and that you have familiarity with the pump that the parent has, then by all means, they may say, hey, can you show us how to set up the pump? And then in that way, you're able to demonstrate and, and show the IBCLC as well as the parent that, yes, I'm comfortable and confident in in doing this and let's say for example you forget a key point well then the IBCLC can say oh and remember that you also want to make sure that you wash your hands before you pump you know you may be you know you may forget that point and so they will then gently remind you of exactly what that point could be so hopefully that answered the question thank you all right Angela next question how do I know if an online course is going to be accepted for example I found Coursera which has a lot of I think courses, but I am unsure if this will be acceptable. So all of the courses have a description on what the course should entail. You just wanna, you, this is one of the things where you have to pay close detailed attention to. So reading the course description, comparing it with the uh, course description that's written by IBLCE to make sure but if you are ever in doubt, because I know this can be frustrating, if you're questioning whether um, it will, my advice would be to uh, call IBLCE directly. 
um, because again, this is an international um, uh, credential. So you really want to make sure that, you know, before you invest in anything to, to make sure that these courses will be accepted. Angela, well, actually, yeah, IBLCE will not answer questions about specific courses any longer. They used oh, wow. to do that, and now they won't. And so oh. if it is from an accredited university who is accredited to teach post-secondary, provide post-secondary education, then it's the organization then that will be okay to provide that. And as I said, a course on, let's say, biology, you know, read through the course description, read through what IBLCE wants it to cover, and you're the person who's gonna to have to make that determination. I would be, you know, if IBLCE is not going to be so picky and say, wait a minute, your course says, you know, biology of, of you know, human biology, or doesn't, you know, IBLCE is, is going to trust that when you submit it, and if you have a course in biology, that it's going to be something which will count. They may ask for, uh, at least the certificate that you pass the course, but they're not going to get into the weeds of what was included in the syllabus and is it appropriate and all of those things. So I, I only say that in order to try to help you to rest assured just a little bit that if the course that you take has the title and a similar description, then chances are it's going to count. Next question, I'm a neonatal nurse for 15 hours i think that might mean years but can i use my hours to get my certificate um you can't use all of your hours as a nurse um, you have to really uh, think about how much time is spent doing actual lactation support at the bedside there is a calculator that the iblce has to help you determine that angela is that another change or no this still the same. <laughs> that, you know, that one they still have <laughs> listen listen we this is about the realness of and this is what happens in healthcare. things change rapidly and sometimes you're in the know and sometimes you're not in the know but you're willing to learn so thank you angela for sharing that change all right um all righty so next question someone asked here if i may um let's see here where oh shoot i just lost it uh let's see oh uh somebody mentioned that the they noticed that the application is currently open for the march 2023 exam and they're not done with everything yet and so the the point is is that everything needs to be complete before you can apply even if you only have let's say you know, 500 hours, clinical hours, and the exam is not until March, so why can't you just like finish up your hours between now and March? It doesn't work that way. Everything has to be complete. Your coursework, both post-secondary courses, your lactation-specific education, and your clinical hours all have to be done before you can actually apply for the exam, so do be mindful of that. Yes, I see Julie has jumped on. Thank you, Julie, for jumping in. I see Julie answering questions. Here's the next question. Is it feasible to look for an internship at a community outreach program or public health facility? It absolutely is feasible if you build relationship and really uh, figure out how you can get those hours. I would say go for it. It, it is feasible. It is one of those, those um, for instance, I know during the pandemic, certain hospital systems have uh, put, put in, um, I would say, mandated certain things where um, sometimes students are able to come in and sometimes they're not able to come in. And so that kind of interferes uh, with the ability to be able to get those clinical hours. So it is feasible. And actually one of the things that I recommend is folks to really look what's in your local community so that you can also have touch points. One of the things of, and I, I can say this being a nurse in the hospital, is that when you're in the hospital setting, you see babies for probably the first week or so, unless you're working in the NICU and you see them a little bit longer. Um, but in the community, you have this ability to see babies from birth all the way through weaning. And so you get this more well-rounded uh, clinical experience, I would say. So absolutely check into that. Good point, thank you. Um, someone is asking if I have more than one mentor, do they all need to be approved by IBLCE? Yes, your mentor, your Pathway 3 plan must be approved prior to beginning. As well as, let's say you add a mentor, you do need to let IBLCE know that you've added a mentor. 
Um, someone else is doing our bridge course. They are currently an RN and they've already got some lactation specific education. They want to know whether or not they need to submit an application for approval on how they plan to get their clinical hours. So if you're doing pathway three, yes. If you're able to use your, um, your nursing degree and if you're working in maternal child health and you have access to breastfeeding and chest feeding families, you can count the hours that you normally would spend for your work. But of course, not 100% of your hours may count towards that. If you're an L&D nurse, only a portion of your hours. Or if you're working in a pediatric office, which I think this person is, then um, yes, I've worked with uh, parents in pediatric office would these hours count or do I need approval before counting them? If they were in the five years prior, it would count. So if you are obtaining clinical hours in the five years prior, then yes, those hours would count if you're doing pathway one. If you're doing pathway three, you need to submit that before you can start to count hours, therefore those previous hours would not count. Did I say that right, Sakita? I was reading the next question. I'm sorry. I okay. No, no, no. And, and actually, Julie has answered, if you currently work with lactation in your setting, then you could follow pathway one. It does not require a plan like pathway three does. If you decide to follow pathway three, though, you'll need to submit a plan and would not be able to count the hours you've already done. You can count your hours you've already done in the last five years. Thank you, Julie. All right. Thanks, Julie. So here's the next question. I'm having a hard time deciphering the major difference between pathways two and three outside of the required hours. I finished my educational requirements and I'm searching for a mentor, but not sure which pathway I should be on. Thanks. The difference between pathway two and three, pathway two is, uh, is done through um, a facility and a university, a lactation college, something like that. Um, whereas pathway three is done in conjunction with a mentor that's not necessarily this um, like a, a community college or a virtual online school those exist so pathway twos are um, explicit lactation programs geared and meet the requirements of a pathway two program and pathway three is a, with a mentor i hope that answers the question angela do you have anything to add well, just to say that pathway two is if you want to get your bachelor's or your master's degree, then you want to go pathway two. If you already have your bachelor's or your master's degree, then do pathway three. So that's the big difference between those two. Or associates. I, I'm aware of an, a program here actually in, in Michigan. So it's it's really college uh, college courses. Great. Oh boy, here's a great question. Can a CBS, a certified breastfeeding specialist, obtain hours through private practice for pathway one, even if they're not a healthcare professional, like a, a nurse or something like that, a speech pathologist? So, so, so y'all, I'm going to tell you a secret. It, it's not really a secret, it's known. However, we haven't been really public about this yet. And that is, is that LER was named as a breastfeeding support organization by IBLCE. We were recognized as one. Therefore, we currently have a pilot program running where you can, as a CBS, obtain your clinical hours through Pathway 1 with LER essentially as providing that space and support for you to gather those hours. So I say we're in a pilot phase right now. Um, if you want to know more information about that, you can reach out to me. Just email support at lactationtraining.com. And Julie or Wendy or Kim will forward your request to me and we can have a conversation about what that looks like and whether or not it's something that you're able to do. So do reach out to us. And now I can I can hear the groans from Julie and Wendy right now that I said to go through support. But do go through support if you want to find out more information about uh, being able to count those hours through Pathway 1 as a CBS. There's a question, is bachelor's or master's a requirement for pathway three? No, it is not. Nope, good question. Um, Actually, I'm trying to think, you don't need a college, any sort of, all you need is, a, is the um, college courses that IBLCE recommends. Right. So you don't even need an associate's degree, so um, you right. don't. Someone is asking, does the exam cost different based on um, which pathway you take? The answer is no. 
So the, the exam is the exam. IBLCE charges one price for the exam. They actually do have a sliding scale depending upon your country in which you work or reside, similar to what LER does with our um, education as well. So there we go. There's a question that I'm, um, um, Angela, maybe contextually you might have the answer. It says, would you suggest that approach even if it is a non-health related bachelor's degree? Absolutely. Um, okay. I mean, you know, if it, if you have, let's say you have a bachelor's degree in, um, in, in what? Let's say you have in anthropology. Let's say you have a bachelor's degree in anthropology and that you want to become an IBCLC. You could either take those few courses or let's say that you really want to have that master's degree in human lactation. So then you could go through one of those organizations that actually have that advanced degree available in human lactation and you can take your those basic courses that you need and end up with a master's degree. So it just sort of depends on what you want to do. And just to make it abundantly clear, you know, Sakita is a nurse and I work exclusively as an IBCLC. So just as an FYI, it can be done. I've been uh, relatively employed, gainfully employed for the better part of uh, 30 years. So not all of them, but done a lot of volunteer work as well, as I know Sakita does too. This is a great question. And I, I would love your, your wondering if you have any insight, Angela. It says, I understand that there's a lactation specific clinical practice cal calculator and that you can approximately come up with your lactation specific clinical hours based off of this. If you are audited, how does IBLCE actually determine how many exact hours you work? Will they ask you to contact previous LCs you worked with in a hospital? What if these previous managers or LCs are retired? That's a good question. So indeed, it's it's there's a lot of um, the trust system which is happening here. And that is, is that let's say you work as a labor and delivery nurse and you go to the calculator and you say, I worked full time as a labor and delivery nurse. Therefore, I worked, let's say, you know, 1800 hours per year and 10 percent of my time was spent supporting breastfeeding and chest feeding families. Therefore, you could count 180 hours per year towards the IBLCE exam. And so if let's say you're audited and, and you increased your percentages, you know, let's say one year you only spent 10% of your time, but then you became interested in becoming a lactation consultant. And now all of a sudden you want to count 30% of your time that you're actually working with, you know, breastfeeding families. Oh, that's great. Let's say you're teaching a class 40% of your time, you know, so IBLC is going to take that, but then they're also going to turn around and let's say they do audit you. They will want to see your spreadsheet that actually totals up the hours and they may ask for uh, a current or previous supervisors you know some sort of you know someone to actually vouch for the fact that you actually did spend that time and so if folks have retired you know you can explain that to iblce um, and it's your supervisors it doesn't necessarily have to be a lactation consultant and so it's your supervisors you know who could attest for your employment hours that would be the question that you want to ask so so hopefully I answered that question well. All right. Uh, next question. Am I correct that to use Pathway 3, I must have an IBCLC mentor before I can start the bridge program and it must be an approved IBCLC? You can start the bridge program whenever you want to. Um, but yes, you have to have approval from pathway three. So you don't have to, you can start doing the bridge and you can submit your pathway based on if you have an agreement already with a mentor. Um, I will tell you, they're going to ask you for your primary mentor and a secondary mentor. Um, so yeah, th th those things are, um, you can do both. There we go, good. Someone asks, how many times can you write the board exam? So you can actually write the exam as many times as you need to until you pass. However, they do charge uh, for each, um, each time you take the exam. So there's the initial fee. And then if you don't pass that time, I think the, you can take it again, but you will have to pay an additional fee. I don't believe you have to take the, you have to pay the full fee. You can take a slightly discounted fee, but you can take it as many times as you have the, um, as you have the resources to actually take the exam as many times as you want. Okay, I think. Oh, let's There's see. another question, Angela, that's um, 
I lost it. It's flagged. It's the one that's a pediatric dentist. Okay. Oh, someone already answered. It was flagged, but it's answered. So. Okay, great. Excellent. I see more. Uh, let's see. Is the five-year limit to applying for the exam only for hours or the, also the 95-hour course? Good question. It's for the 95-hour course as well. Yeah. If you're enrolled in a lactation course, are you able to begin your clinical hours? So that would, if you're enrolled in a 95-hour course, you know, can you begin your clinical hours? Some mentors will require that you are um, either complete, have finished your lactation-specific education or that you're very close to being done. So it really depends upon the mentor in which you choose as far as whether or not you can start to count those hours. The other thing I want to be clear is observation hours are not counted. It's the actual um, hours that you are engaging with families. Correct. Okay, great. Well, I think we've gotten all the questions. There's one more there for you, Sakita, so I'll let you determine that one. So thank you very much everyone for taking the time to, to listen to us today. If you do have any other questions, you are welcome to reach out to support at lactationtraining.com. If you want to chat with either Sakita or myself, you are welcome to uh, you're welcome to reach out to us as well through the support um, website. Just to confirm I can obtain hours as a CBS through private practice if I'm also an RN. You can obtain your hours as a CBS through private practice if you're part of the pilot program. And so the RN piece doesn't matter. So please do reach out to us and I can, I'd can i be more than happy to answer more questions about that. Angela, I have to answer this question. I'm sorry, we can't go yet. If you are Good. a pediatric doctor, which path do you suggest? I would suggest pathway three. <laughs> um, you know, um, so, yeah, I would suggest Pathway 3. If you want to talk more about why I would suggest that, please email us. Um, but Pathway 3 will um, really expose you to the exact clinical hours, help you focus in on the clinical competencies that are necessary. And um, it's 500 hours. I know that would be a lot, but linking up with a local IBCLC to really see how IBCLCs practice, as well as how IBCLCs and, pedi and pediatricians collaborate amongst one another to really uh, provide this whole multidisciplinary team lactation support, because a lot of times that's what's lacking. Um, you know, so absolutely, I would say pathway three. I don't know if you have a different uh, answer, Angela, but uh, I, I think, no. It's yeah. because thinking as a lactation consultant is different than thinking as a physician. Yeah. And so it's really important to know how to differentiate between the two. And the IBLCE exam is based on real clinicians, you know, it's, it's real clini clinicians. And so to me, it's really important that you know what, uh, what a lactation consultant does and how they do it and what their thought process, you know, how do they, what's, where's their discernment, where's their critical thinking. Uh, in regards to that, as well as how to collaborate. So we would recommend pathway three, you can do pathway one, and we would recommend that you do pathway three. So that's a great way to uh, finish the webinar today. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. Anything you wanna add, Sakita? No, I just love that we had a, a pediatrician in the space that asked that question. I'm just excited about the possibilities. And so I, I'm excited for everyone that joined, but that, that question struck me as we are dealing with uh, in right now um, other issues with infant, with infant feeding. And so it would be great to have everyone on the same page. And so I'm excited. That just made me excited. But thank you all for joining us. Um, this has been a pleasure. Someone said this was great. I appreciate that comment. Thank you so much. And reach out to us if you need anything. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.